Well, brothers and sisters, it's good to be with you again. Welcome on Wednesday night here at Downsview Baptist Church as we continue to seek to grow in holiness and grow in our conformity to the will of and even ultimately to the image of our God. I want to welcome you and give me a minute just to be sure that uh, we're all up here properly on the computer so I can connect with you a little bit. It's always good if folks will come and uh, say hello to us on uh, Wednesday evenings. Wow, look at that. Looks like we're there. Okay. A little bit. Appreciate it if when you come on in uh, that you'll say hello to us and let us know that you're here. And let us know that uh, you subscribed to both our YouTube channel and that you like this video. I've said to you a number of times, I don't get it, but I know it's helpful for us as we uh, move through our evening together. It does something for us as the visibility of it or whatever it might be uh, to allow us to uh, broadcast, so to speak, and to connect with others beyond our, our church walls. Again, I emphasize this is Downsview Baptist Church. I am your shepherd and you are my primary audience. Love to serve you folks. Glad to have the opportunity to do that. But as a ministry from our church that we all want is other people potentially connecting with us as well. So praise God for technology that allows us to do that. So I'll try to watch as you come in. Looks like uh, Renello. ah, there you are. Good to see you, brother. Thanks for coming again tonight. Thank you for your faithfulness. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the concerns that Brunello and his family have on their heart later this evening. But to begin, let's ask God to help us, shall we, as people start to come in and we start to uh, go before the Lord tonight. Let's, let's pray together. So Father in heaven, thank you for the pleasure that it is to count ourselves amongst your children, to count ourselves amongst your servants, to count among ourselves amongst your ambassadors, those who are here for you and who are eager to speak on your behalf. We do not have a message for this world that resides in us. We have nothing that resides in us apart from what you have put there. We are your people by your grace, and we are so thankful for it. You made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we, through him, could indeed become the very righteousness of God. So thank you for sending our Savior, the Lord Jesus, into this world, and that he might model for us joyful servanthood, and that as we seek to encourage ourselves in how we should relate to our civil governments in particular, and the authority figures that we have in this world, we do that tonight, dear God. Help us, give us wisdom, give us patience, give us grace, give us an eagerness to do it in not only the fact of doing it, but in the manner and the method that you give us. Hear our prayer tonight, Father. We are looking forward to being with your people and through your word together in Christ. Amen. So we do have uh, some reopenings happening. As you know, a number of our churches were able to meet two Sundays ago, and most of the churches in Ontario were able to meet last Sunday, but we're not just there yet. But we're on the way. I mean, the, the trajectory is encouraging. I keep talking about trajectories, but the fact is that all kinds of churches have been open. We continue to see the number of cases uh, slowly move down. We see the vaccinations are up, and hallelujah for that. Uh, my medical family as you know my son my wife my son daughter-in-law all are in the medical front lines and they are slowly uh, getting vaccinated themselves so we're grateful for that there's a lot of talk about it now in ontario that all of the long-term care homes both the residents and the uh, staff have been vaccinated and they're moving on now to these different uh, opportunities within the local health units to actually see this vaccine to be distributed. Those 80 and older are given priority. Uh, they're nevertheless still given priority, uh, giving priority to the frontline workers that go beyond the long-term care homes. And so we're glad for that. We have every expectation that these kind of facilities will continue to open around Toronto 
And uh, throughout the province, I'm starting to hear about brothers of mine who are seeing hockey arenas and community centers and uh, university field houses, those kinds of things. I'm not sure what we're going to set up here exactly in Toronto yet, but it's happening. And we have uh, an encouragement, uh, certainly along that, that line. So hi, Aminda. Glad you're there at home as well with, uh, with Ron. Thank you. I'm always glad to see your, your face there on the screen, at least. Um, but as we continue to move in this direction, friends, we need the continual prayer support and encouragement as best we can. Uh, Elaine Devilla, who is our medical officer of health here in Toronto. Of course, Dr. David Williams, who oversees the entire province. Elizabeth Tam, who sees the entire Health Canada project. And so be praying for them, if you would, in these coming weeks. It's exciting days. As you know, our services are only online then because we can't open yet. We aren't in person. Two more Sundays at least. The earliest that we can be back would be the second Sunday of March. So we're waiting for the March the 9th, which is the next day that the lockdown and stay-at-home orders have been extended to. And then we'll see after that. But until then, come on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock and we'll be here, Lord willing, either a live on Facebook or there'll be a link on Facebook that will take you directly to our pre-recorded video on YouTube. Again, so grateful that David Hallett was willing to stand in last Sunday, gave me some time to get um, some other business done around the church. And, a change is as good as a break, and I didn't think I needed it, but I noticed that I appreciated it. So thank you again, David. Sir, appreciate a fine sermon. Any of you who haven't heard it, just go to our website there at downsviewbaptistchurch.com. You'll see the archives there from all of our media presentations. When you go to our website, you'll see it like this. I've inserted this little yellow uh, arrow that if you go there on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, it says live stream Sunday at 11 and either you'll click there and it'll go to a live stream or we'll go to the Facebook page same place you're watching us now and you'll be able to see a link there that will take you directly over to our YouTube channel so not hard to find uh, you can just go to our YouTube channel directly or you can come on the church's website but that's really the easiest place for trying to use that as a bit of a hub let's see who else is here tonight there is Grant and Bev your faithfulness is always encouraging. And there's Raph, our fellow brother in the Lord and one of our leaders here at the church. Thanks for coming, all of you gang. We're really glad that, uh, that you're here. I'm just checking to see if there's anyone else. Looks like we're in good shape there, okay. Not getting any panicked messages yet from folks who can't get on, but we'll, we'll see. Again, hit that like button. Uh, glad that I think it looks like everybody there has, has done that. I don't know exactly what it does for us, it, but it's, uh, it's worth hitting. So, so that's where we are in terms of our online services and our Sunday mornings. Uh, remember, we have had a pretty successful time immediately after our worship service with our little Zoom coffee time. Our service just goes from 11 till noon, and a few minutes later, we all just jump on our computers and have the kind of conversations we have in the parking lot. Just connect with each other like we would in the foyer. Just kind of chat and catch up a bit like we would hanging around the pews afterwards. We have, I was surprised to see even the news media said that there's a sign of hope. That there's an opportunity for us to come back together legitimately and somewhat normal even by this fall and so it's like boy we're looking forward to something that really is happening and for us to be back together as a church family both in worship here and as those numbers continue to go up boy i i just can't wait for another soup sunday downstairs i miss the borscht that the ladies make so wonderfully those great little sandwiches downstairs but just hanging around and working the room and, and coming upstairs here and seeing some of the folks hanging out in the lobby because there's not enough room. What a nice problem to have. So boy, Lord willing, that will be sooner than later. Hello, Gabriel. Glad you're coming. And Ruth as well. Good. I'm glad you got on. Ruth I was watching for you there. Okay. Excellent. So as a church family, one of the issues of church unity that we try to sort of live out is where the Bible in 1 Corinthians tells us that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. 
that when one part of the body is affected, it affects everything, or in the analogy, every one of us. And so just a week or so ago, it was actually on our deacons meeting on Zoom, so I guess it was last Thursday, Ranello and Minda, who you see here, Ranello was mentioning to me that, as you know, they come from the Philippines, and their home church in the Philippines had had a very difficult time this past around, it was actually around Christmas time. And of course, this affects their whole family. Larnie and, and RJ are, are here, and Andrea, some pictures of them there. But they were mentioning to us about how their church back home in the Philippines had a very devastating time at, at Christmas time. It was just before Christmas, there was an earthquake at 6.8 magnitude, which sounds like an awful lot, I think, and the buildings were like, were totally demolished. The name of the church is Baniel Baptist Church. And you can actually see, well, you probably can't see it very clearly, but it's up on the, the top there. But this is like the temporary shelters that they've kind of erected so that they're still able actually to worship. This is actually a little video of one of their uh, youth groups and the children's programs that they have running there at the church. The church is, is located in Banatal, Tulunan, North Cotabato in the Philippines. And I was asking Renillo how, how the folks were doing and, and, and how are things going. And he started to tell me, Pastor is a name, uh, Johnny Blanchia. And Johnny, I think I have his picture as well here, and his wife and children, and that one of their ministry events, that they said, you know, could we pray for their church? And I said, of course, we certainly should do that. There's close connections. This is actually the church where Ranillo and Minda were married. And so there's some real personal attachment to that, as any of you have, like I have in my home church back in Thunder Bay. A number of you have come from other churches. And so as I was chatting with Renel, I called him the other day and I said, listen, are, are you uh, able to send money to give a hand with that? Because I said, Pam and I would like to contribute if we, if we could. I didn't know how we would do it. And he said he's been doing that. And again, this is nothing to do with receipts, tax donations. This is nothing to do about registered charities. It's nothing like that. It's taking money and handing it to someone. It's just giving it to someone in need. So it's uncomplicated. It's simple. Again, sometimes I know folks are very concerned. Well, is it real? Is it a real situation? Is it, is it authentic? Is somebody taking advantage of it? I don't trust anyone. You know, you're never sure who's going to be trying to take you. We trust Renillo and Minda that this is their home church and they have been devastated by an earthquake. And so we were able just to send Renillo an e-transfer and just trust him to send the money on to the church there. And so I wanna pray for this folks, but if you felt led that you'd like to contribute to some reconstruction there in a very tangible, personal, mission-oriented way, one of the things that we know at our church is that foreign missions is a bit of a weakness for us, isn't it? We, we haven't had a lot of thought about that. It, we, we remember David and Cindy when they come back from China. We remember David when he gives us a, a, an email or, or a newsletter when he's overseas. And yet be, beyond that, there's, there's not a whole lot of talk about that, is there? And so in God's providence, we've been given an opportunity. And again, Renello and Minda have said nothing about this. I've asked their permission but listen, uh, there's no uh, pressure here at all. There's no even initiative from them. It's totally from me. I just thought, listen, here's a part of our church family that have an opportunity. And so if you'd like to contribute, just contact Ronello, uh, Ronello and Minda uh, directly, and they'll help you to do that. Again, this is not a, uh, an offering that comes to our church or through our church. Our church is not taking up an offering officially. It's not like that. I'm just giving the appeal out there. Uh, an appeal that they have not made. I'm making it. They have not asked for this. The church has not asked for this, but they certainly could could use it. Of course, they're you know four or five months away after this uh, awful earthquake, and there's going to be some time for them to try to rebuild their uh, place of of ministry there. So let's let's pray together, shall we, for a moment, brothers? Father God, thank you for the prayers of the brethren that we are able to come together in unity with a purpose to see the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, continue to be expanded around the globe. 
And this unique opportunity you've given us was the connection with the Sargento family. We thank you for it. We ask for Pastor Johnny and the extended leadership there and the church family at the Banatal Baptist Church there in the Philippines. I pray, dear God, for grace for them. I thank you for their faith. I thank you for their eagerness to honor the Lord Jesus Christ with their lives. I thank you for the heritage of this church with Renillo and, and Minda having their wedding day in this place. And now it's gone and there's a temporary structure. And dear God, you know their needs, you know the provision they require. And if you would move us, dear God, to have the opportunity to ask for your care for them, but also potentially provide for them financially. We're grateful, dear God, for just a, an easy and simple and clear opportunity just to give to those who are in need. They're not even asking, but we're asking you to move us to give. And we ask for your care for them, your restoration of their place, your continued, uh, giving them a continued passion and fervency to see the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ both lived out and sh uh, spread to other people as well. So thank you for the opportunity we have to ask your help for them. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And so friends, just keep that in mind. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention this evening. As far as our teaching tonight goes, we are returning to what we began last week, which is the church's relationship to the government. And there's been a lot of talk about this since last March, and there continues to be a lot of talk about it. There is a, a pastor in Alberta who has actually been um, charged and charged seriously and was uh, given a opportunity to go back to his ministry with the provision that he would not again uh, gather in the church. His lawyer was on quite publicly today saying that he breached those uh, conditions essentially of his release and, and he's been in prison because of it. He's not been in prison because he's preaching the gospel. He's not in prison because he's seeking to do what God has told him to do. That's not it. It's explicitly a law issue that he breached the conditions of his release. Nevertheless, wow, a big deal that there's a connection between the imprisonment and the gospel ministry. There's a number of folks, as you know, out in the Guelph area, down in the Niagara area, who feel very strongly that the government doesn't have the right to do this, that uh, others have accused churches like ours of cowardice, that you know, you're, you're afraid of the government, you're afraid to be open, uh, you don't understand the science, and we're quick to say, of course we don't understand the science, and what we're trying to do in, to bring some clarity to this is to say, we must stay in our lane. We are pastors, we are teachers, we are church people, we are not epidemiologists, we are not physicians, we are not research, we are not scientists. And by no means does the science all agree you want the science to say one thing, keep looking on the internet, you'll find it to say that. Whether it's one extreme is a hoax and the other extreme that this thing's never going to be over. There's just so much conversation out there. So what are we to do at the church? And my suggestion is that there is a kind of submission to the governing authorities that is ultimately a submission to God. And it's never absolute, but that's where we begin. And the gentleman who's helping me with this is my buddy, Wyatt Graham. He's seen here with his wife, Leanne. Wyatt is the executive director of the Gospel Coalition here in Canada. Some of you know the Gospel Coalition started by Pastor Tim Keller and Pastor uh, Dr. Uh, Don Carson in the US. And there's a number of chapters in Europe, Australia. Not sure where the other ones are around the world, but there has been one in Canada for some time. It is headquartered in Ontario out of West Highland Church in Hamilton, which is one of our Feb churches where John Mahaffey is not only the lead pastor there, but he's part of the uh, TGC Canada board of directors or however they call themselves. But Wyatt is employed and he's employed there. He has a doctorate from Southern Baptist Seminary. He's a brilliant young man, but a guy who's very accessible. And as I was reading just one of his uh, posts on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, he had an awful lot to say about this. And I made and took his notes 
and with his permission sought to distill them into a bit of a study for us. And sort of appreciation for him, you can see he has a couple of different websites and blogs and podcasts, but wyattgraham.com is an easy place for you to find him. He actually has a special online presentation tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. So if you go to wyattgraham.com or you just go to his page on Facebook, you can see that he has a couple of guests here, but what about religious freedom? And some of the things we've talked about for the last couple of weeks will be talked about in more detail even tomorrow evening. So that's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. This is what it's called, What About Religious Freedom? This is actually the posting from Facebook, and so you can go on there and find it. But I'm going to try to take that in tomorrow night just to see an expansion of some of this. And so as much as we like the word from Wyatt, Wyatt would point us to the word of God, a word from God. And so we're going to begin this portion as we love to do with our scriptures open to the 13th chapter, in this case, of the book of Romans, which is no surprise for anyone who is walking through this debate and through this issue over the next little while. Just see anyone else who's here. Yeah, we're glad to pray for you, Renillo and the church family and Pastor Johnny. It is Johnny, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Alex Bell, hey brother, good to see your face on there. And, and Chinsia, I've got you on your little profile picture there, so good to see you, man. Thanks, folks, for saying hi when you come in here when, again tonight. So for the sake of what's on the screen, let me turn and, and read it along with you, but do see that you're looking at your copy of God's Word, Romans chapter 13, the book of Romans, of course, written to the church at Rome. Uh, David Hallett had us there on Sunday morning in chapter 15. I touched on chapter 14 in our preview this morning, and now we're in chapter 13. We're actually going to go back to Romans 15 this Sunday to see expanding on some of the applications that David so beautifully made for us this past week. And so we'll be in the book of Romans for a little bit here. Book of Romans, of course, as David mentioned to us on Sunday, is the book that God used to bring Martin Luther to himself, where he saw in chapter 1 and verse 16 that the just shall live by faith. That righteousness comes by faith, by trusting God, not by the works of the law. And of course, the first chapter lays out man's terrible condition, verse 18 and, and following, that, that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and wickedness of men who have suppressed the truth in their unrighteousness. Chapter 2 talks about the reality that God is going to be patient, wanting to bring people to repentance. Chapter 3 has the beautiful dichotomy there of that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all of the different ways that it's there, but showing that man thinks he's righteous, that's the dichotomy, but he's not. Chapter four has that beautiful presentation of the gospel that God justifies ungodly people, not godly people, but ungodly people. Chapter five has this beautiful declaration that therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God and how our character then is going to grow. Chapter 6 asks the question almost rhetorically like, ah, so when sin was in the world, God brought grace to save us from sin. So maybe I should sin more and we'll get more grace. Shall, shall we sin then shall, so that grace may abound? And chapter 6, of course, is by no means. We have died to sin. How can we now live in it? Chapter 7 has that that sort of confused, is it is it the my state before I was a Christian or when I'm a Christian that, hey, listen, we, we don't want to do the things that we, we do, and yet we do the very things that we don't want to do. And that's certainly a struggle for a Christian. I'm convinced it's actually in the text a pre-Christian struggle that he's speaking about. But uh, nevertheless, there's this struggle that we can learn about in chapter 7 to be sure, and thank God for being delivered from. And then, of course, the great 8 in chapter 8, that there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. The wrestling in verse 9, that, that, that Israel is going to be brought in, in in some way. That chapter 10 has the affirmation that yet again, listen, uh, if, if you don't call on the name of the Lord, you're not going to be saved. And that little string of salvation that how can they, how can they call on one in whom they've not believed and how can they believe in someone who they never heard and how will they hear unless someone preaches to them and how can they preach unless they're sent. And nevertheless, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, 
the validation of God's plan, even in not all Israel is Israel, but there's some kind of renewal in ethnic Israel. And chapter 12, of course, is saying, great. Now, in view of the mercy of God, in almost a summary statement of the first 11 chapters, let's live in light of that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect well. And so part of that, living out the Christian life, seeking peace, seeking harmony, seeking unity. Here we come to chapter 13, which speaks about how do we relate as a church to the government. And thus our title for this evening, and we'll pick up where we left off last week. But I do want to give us the first five verses of chapter 13, therefore. So let's read together, shall we? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. By the by, remember, this is Nero, this diabolical Roman emperor who's in charge at Rome as Paul is writing this letter. Let, let, let that sink in, brothers and sisters. This is not Justin Trudeau. This is not Doug Ford. This is not John Tory. This, this is one of the most horrible people in the history of Christian persecution who used to light his gardens with the burning bodies of slaughtered Christians, who would find amusement to have Christians slaughtered in, in entertainment for the, the masses. This is, this is not Stephen Harper. This is not John Cretchen. This is not Pierre Trudeau. This is not people that come to our minds as previous leaders of our country. Brothers and sisters, the idea that the governing authorities now are so bad or so stupid or so incompetent or so out of touch, therefore we shouldn't have to obey them. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are being not our little pretend persecution here in Canada. Let's face it, that's what it is, isn't it? None of us really know what that's like in our country. Certainly not like the audience of the book of Romans knew it. So we shouldn't obey because of the quality of our leaders. It's just removed immediately when you realize who the leader was when this was written to. So let's just keep that in mind. Let every person be subject to Nero. That's what he just said. There's limits on this. I know there's limits on that, but we don't start there. There's exceptions to the rule because there's a rule. <laughs> you don't live in the exceptions. You can't have exceptions unless you have a base. This is our base. Subject to submission to the governing authorities. Why would you tell us to do that? Because, for, because there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Now that's a pretty good reason. That's a pretty good reason. We should submit to the governing authorities because God put them there. God put the ones who are there, there. They've been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Well, sure. That just follows in the flow of logic. And those who resist will incur judgment. We don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like to be judged when I do wrong. I want to get off. I don't, I don't want to have any kind of conviction for doing something wrong. And we don't want other people to have conviction. It's wrong when we read about in the papers people being fined and people having consequences of breaking the law. But the expectation should be, as we read this, is that we resist the governing authorities. There's a judgment that will be incurred. For, again, because the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is authority? Yes. Well, then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he's God's servant for your good. He's God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he, who is God's servant for your good, does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, 
One must be in subjection. One must be in subjection. There's a must be subjection to something, to someone, to some degree. One must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Conscience is that little voice inside you. <laughs> conscience is that God-given instinct to right and wrong. And we want our consciences not to be seared, that we don't listen anymore, that there's no sense of right and wrong in us. We don't want to sear that by an ongoing pattern of disobedience, an ongoing pattern of disregard for God's word. We want to subject ourselves to the governing authorities to avoid God's wrath and also so that we will grow in our understanding and our, even our instinct of right and wrong. Someone else, ah, Pastor Johnny, look at that from on the other side of the world. I'm not sure what time it is there, Johnny, but great to see you there, brother. Watching here from the Philippines and Elizabeth, Raph's wife is here as well, that's great. Thanks so much, Pastor Pete, for the prayers. God bless you, he says to us. So how cool is that, eh? <laughs> here we are on the other side of the world, brother, and we're chatting. We just introduced, got introduced to each other just a couple of hours ago. And so, yeah, that's just, I just think this is so cool. All right, and so remember, back at Christmas time, we went to Isaiah chapter 9 and heard that the government shall be upon his shoulders. When we say the governing authorities receive their authority from God, it's because the one who governs the governors, he's the one who's ultimately in charge. And so a couple of quick thoughts that we have that sort of help shape our conversation. Number one, the government is given for our good. Government is given for our good. The Bible says that as explicitly as it can, chapter 13, verse 4, for he is God's servant for your good. That means these gentlemen are God's servants for your good. They are God's servants. They are appointed by God. I don't understand all that. I don't understand all the questions that I have, like Job asked almost before the Lord going, you've got to be kidding me. This is a guy that you want running our country with the murder by medicine, with the horrible murder of the unborn, where the pretend definition of marriage you won't even recognize anymore, that this is a guy we want in charge of our country, Lord? And never mind the other policies, but it's just, okay, Lord, you've got to start with, he's your servant for our good. That's where we begin. These gentlemen are God's servants, bylaw officers, people who break up businesses that will not obey the health authority protocols. If you get a parking ticket, if you get cited for something in a, an outdoor gathering, they are God's servants for our good. So government is there for our good. Secondly, submissive submission to government is for our good. Now, just make sense? If government's there for our good, then submitting to them is for good because God calls us to submit to the ones that are there for our good. That's the truth of it. In verse 3 of chapter 13, do what is good, you'll receive his approval. I know. I know, but we don't live there. But we don't live there. We don't live the, in the yeah, but what about? That's not where we live. We start with, right? You understand, we're building a foundation here of what's obvious and what's clear. Doesn't Alistair Begg reminds us that the main things are the plain things. And the plain things are the main things when it comes to our understanding of the Christian life. Government is there for our good which means submission to government is for our good. And the third major thought is our submission for God, submission for our good, our submission for our good comes with the belief that it is not for our good. God knows that. <laughs> God knows that he says it's for our good. He knows we don't believe that. Why? I know that. Why? Because he then says, submit to them. The whole concept of submission holds within it an idea, an entailment that we're not going to agree. You don't have to call someone to submit. 
right? Wives to husbands, parent, children to parents, congregations to leaders, or citizens to the government. Those four areas in the scriptures that call for submission and to God-given authority. You don't have to tell people that they have to submit if we're going along. It just, just inherent in it is that we're not going to agree. We're not going to see it the same way. And God knows that. And because God knows we're not going to think it's for our good, he's going to call us to say, listen, you got to follow their dictates and the way they're moving. And so, as I just checked, hey, Ross, I thought you had your own prayer meeting tonight. Maybe it's over already. Glad you're amongst us, buddy. Ross is a pastor, as you know, down at the Bible Chapel there in, in Oakville. And we were exchanging pulpits a few months back. And we actually had a long conversation about this this morning. So maybe he's checking up on me and seeing how we're, uh, we're going to do there. But uh, yeah, hope the folks at Arendelle Bible Chapel are doing well, brother. Appreciate you very much. So let's review. We had the first three points last week that Wyatt gave to us. Respect for government is respect for God. That's the broad category. And you'll notice that we're redoing our constitution a bit here, but our statement of faith is the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches statement of faith. And the article on civil government that we who are members at this church have agreed to reads like this. We believe that civil government is of divine appointment for the interest and good order of society that magistrates, that's a fancy word for the governing authorities, that magistrates are to be prayed for, consistent, I always get that word wrong, conscientiously honored and obeyed, except only in the things opposed to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Lord of the conscience and Prince of the kings of the earth. And so it's clear, even in our church, we begin with the same kind of premise. Respect for government is indeed respect for God. Do you remember the passage in Acts chapter 23? I'm just going to read that for you. I'm trying to move relatively quickly. But the passage in Acts 23, as the Apostle Paul is before the religious leaders, in this case, and there's that interesting blend of civil and religious authority in those days. But the first five verses of Acts chapter 23... Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded that those who stood by him strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Well, he gives it to him. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Paul's hot. And Paul's got some logic. Paul's calling for justice. Verse 4 says, those who stood by said, would you reveal God's high priest? And Paul said, verse 5, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now I realize that that's a quote from the Old Covenant Scriptures. But the Apostle Paul brings, that in, brings it forward in the concept that there is a kind of respect that is due, submission to, respect to governing authorities, which is a respect for and a submission even to our Lord. That's why it puts it this way. When scripture commands that you speak well of the body that helped crucify the Messiah, then you do it. So submission to government is, in a sense, submission to God. I realize it's not an exact submission, but that's the category. The second thought we had is that submission to unjust authorities is submission to God. Now, this one's more difficult, isn't it? Because we've talked a bit about this, where the passage in Romans chapter 13 comes from. But the passage that we looked at was 1 Peter chapter 2, to see that it's not just in, in one place. Hebrews, James, Peter, if you're looking in your scriptures. Chapter 2, verse 18, Peter says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So here the authority is the given authority over a servant in a household over the servant. And he says you want to give all respect and dignity not just to those who are good and gentle, but those who are unjust. Because, verse, six, verse 19, this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures suffering, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. 
For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he uttered no threats, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. And so the idea there was that submission to authority is submission to God. It includes submission to unjust authority, to difficult to submit to authorities, to authorities that we don't agree with, to authorities that don't take the same perspective as we do. Does that sound like any authorities out there? Yeah, it sounds like most of them. Time and time again, we feel free to disagree with our politicians and therefore we think at times we don't have to submit to them. And it's interesting that this comes in the time of COVID and questions of civil disobedience among churches and other things, of course, other institutions. But I was saying to some of the guys this past week, listen, the same reason that people don't want to wear their masks is the same reason that people do 150 in a 90 kilometer hour zone because we live in a lawless society. We do not expect the police that are charged and paid and, and put out there to obey the, to enforce the law, we don't expect them to. And in fact, when they do, they're the awful police officer gave me a ticket, right? The wonderful police officer let me go. So now the wonderful police officer is the lawless one who doesn't enforce the law, not that they don't have some freedom to do that, and frankly, who isn't glad for that at times. But the horrible one is the one who actually enforces the law. But we don't expect that, and we don't see that. And so we don't, we don't expect consequences from breaking the law. And when we have those consequences, we think the one enforcing it is the problem. Instead, brothers and sisters, there has to be a sense that we're beginning with, I wanna honor God by honoring the governing authorities. And the way I honor the governing authorities is being in submission to them, which is being in submission to God, even when I don't agree, when they are overtly wrong. Not just when I think they might be wrong. Not when we just have a difference of opinion. But the text there says not only in, in verse 18, not only to the good and gentle, but to the unjust which is a very gospel example of Jesus, who when he was reviled by the religious and civil authorities, he did not revile in return. When he suffered at the unjust hand of the religious and civil authorities, the masses of people screaming, crucify him, crucify him. When he suffered, he didn't utter any threats. Let him come down off that cross you know let him save himself he saved others he can't save himself why doesn't he call elijah why doesn't he call ten thousand angels as the old song goes because the gospel is a picture of the innocent suffering for the guilty the most unjust act in the history of the planet is the act that's the hinge upon which the door turns for our eternal salvation when we surrender that Jesus has done everything required to get me into an eternal relationship with God, just lay yourself bare, friends, and trust him. Surrender to that fact and therefore to that person. That's the gospel picture of even submission to unjust authorities. Why it puts it this way. John Calvin and the magisterial reformers as well see this as a must submission to unjust authorities, because no one can be truly just in this life. Nobody's going to be absolutely just. So sometimes we seem to make that a condition and it's saying, where are you going to find that? Where are you going to find a, a governing authority that's absolutely perfectly just? He goes on to say the opposite of not submitting to even unjust authorities is anarchy. Anarchy is worse than an overbearing government. And we know that because that's how the scripture lays it out. And so the third part here is that the church is called to submit to the state. That's a fact that's clear. 
And we have some uh, speak, spoken about it here in our opening scripture in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 1. At every person, every person, including every person within the church, be subject to the governing authorities. I love how I hear Wyatt reminding us that we already realize that the government and we recognize the government has every right to call us to be in submission to electrical codes in our buildings to the fire marshal and the building capacities that we have, to the food preparation in our buildings. If you have a kitchen, you have to have certain fire uh, exhausts and fire suppression if it's at a certain level. You have to have certain kinds of equipment that are CSA approved. You can only cook under certain conditions and you must store it in safe conditions. We realize that the issue of fire alarms and potentially fire suppression systems in some place, the government gives us laws that we submit to about that. We recognize that they have every authority to speak to us about RevCap and that we file our proper paperwork. I know we don't pay tax like other places pay taxes, but the fact is that there's a connection to RevCan, and we so appreciate Emmy and, and Colleen and Andre and Florence, those who help us to see that those things are prepared and filed properly. We understand our charitable status here, that we can actually have tax receipts given at a church, and we know the government, of course, can govern and call us to submit to how that needs to be done. Issue of payroll deductions that come off of my check and irises and others who work for us every once in a while. We know that the government has every reason to do that. And not every church, of course, has a property tax the same way as you have a house. But places that rent buildings or that build buildings, especially in a place like Toronto where you can't build a church and expect to be tax exempt anymore. The property value is just too much. And the way you can do it here in Toronto is to take over an existing church or you can rent a place and you just rent it as if it's a, a dance studio or a, a community hall. It doesn't make any difference now. But you know and we say the government has every place to call us to submit to them in all kinds of areas. Why it puts it this way. God gives the government of mankind authority over all of us. Christians or not, they can arrest you. They can punish you for evil. Anyone who breaks the law and there's an expectation that the government is not overstepping when it's enforcing the law of the land, whether you are a Christian or whether it's just a, a secular person. So you submit to the government is a submission to God. A submission to unjust authority is a submission to God. God has every right to call the church to submit to the state. And number four tonight, God protects the church through the state. God even protects the church through what happens within the state. Again, verse 3 of Romans chapter 13, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Do we want to see that as we live out our Christian lives and we conduct our Christianity, that we don't want any fear of the governing authority? Then... Do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. That's every expectation that we have exactly that, right? That if we want to have the approval of the state, we seek to follow and submit to the state. And, and let's face it, we here at Downsview Baptist Church have made a, a concerted effort that we haven't made for a while and say, hey, look, we got to have our fire plan up to date. And Catherine has been so much help to us, and a number of folks have come in to repair things, and we've had uh, other agencies in to actually do it professionally for us. We've had documentation up. I look around here, and there's a firebox there, and there's uh, new signage over the uh, fire alarms and the signage to see that we're physically distant in terms of COVID and we're constantly getting our chairlift uh, insured and checked twice a year. We make sure that we have our grounds uh, kept in good condition before we put the sign out front. We made sure we talked to the um, whatever the bylaw people are in Toronto, that it's in the right spot. We have a permit to do that. When we did the renos in the building here, we knew we had to have a building uh, construction permit, I guess, I'm not sure what those are called. Uh, we had to do that. We knew that. And we're scrupulous about that. And we're getting even more scrupulous. When we find areas that we've fallen short, we're doing that because we realize, good, everything goes fine. The government protects us. 
We are cared for by the state when we submit to the state. When we fail to do that, when we go against them, then we expect the government not to protect us, but discipline or come against us. So again, big pictures, but that's the reality of that. Why it puts uh, one, here's one note here that says this, any assumption that the church forms a bubble that is free of the state, it incorrectly understands God's ordination of the magistrate. They organize our life here below. They can't risk control our spiritual regeneration nor our freedom to love or to pray. Those things only belong to the kingdom of Christ. But while we live in the flesh, God protects us against anarchy through the state, even a state that we may, or authorities that we may disagree with. He puts it this way. Oh, that's the text I just read. <laughs> even states that we disagree with. And so... The idea is that we're protected in that submission, which is ultimately to God, even if it's unjust, and that there's a sense that we actually have a level of protection because of that. The fifth thought is that God guards our hearts from hypotheticals. Excuse me. I would take the whole evening just on this one. Graham has this wonderful phrase, what about ism, right? And some of you have heard me say a number of times, it's the yeah, but what about response. And that's exactly the response he's, he's giving us here. And let me, let me read you a, a section here. What aboutism says, but what about the Nazis? Whenever the most extreme is cited to make sense of a lesser situation, then something runs amiss. Whenever an extreme is, is cited, to make sense of a lesser situation, there is something wrong. See what he's getting at here? It's like, well, so you're saying that we should just submit to the government no matter what they say. They tell you to jump off a bridge, you're gonna jump off a bridge. They tell you to smack your partner around, then you're gonna do that. They tell you you can't do this for your children, then you're just gonna do whatever they say. Friends, that kind of desperation just shows the insecurity of a position that's trying to be put forward. And sometimes betrays the fact that we really are standing on, on a clay foundation rather than concrete. The what aboutism, the extremes, what about this, what about this, what about this? You know what's gonna happen. What's the other one? It's the slippery slope argument, right? It's the what about might happen if we don't do and we don't do. And there can be this whole sense that, you know, if we don't stand up now, we're going to lose all the protections we have in the state. Friends, there may be a lot more people who are omniscient than I am, but I just don't think we can call it like that. People have to operate according to the consciences. I appreciate that. And I want to grow and understand that as Romans 14 will talk about. But in the short term, when you just stare at this, that, again, I, I, I just I love how, how Wyatt puts it. The point here is, of course, you would not actively obey an evil command to murder or whatnot. But what about ism here simply annoys? Because what it does is it casts real issues into the hypothetical. And God's direction keeps us from the hypothetical. It keeps you and I from saying, well... You know, this government's not a really godly government. Is that what we're going to obey or not? There are areas to disobey the government. There are situations to be sure. And, and we'll get to all that at some point as we talk this through. But that's not where we begin. We don't begin with the exception. We begin with the rule. And we don't begin with the extreme, what about, yeah, but what about ism? We begin with the clear instructions of Scripture. And we trust the God who has clearly given us these things. Even when we don't get it, when I don't understand it, when I don't see the point, when I'm certain what they're doing is wrong, there's a kind of submission to God, there's a kind of walking by faith, not by sight. I don't see the point. God's like, I know. Do you trust me? Yes, I trust you. Well, let's see. You don't see the point, but let's let me see if you really trust me. 
and that will be by obeying me especially when not just when especially when you don't trust me number six here is god is ultimately the one restricting our freedoms and boy that's 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 really important for us to understand isn't it that if god is the one who's in charge the government's really on his shoulders the governing authorities that are there are appointed by him then what then it's ultimately the restriction comes from our lord that's what he says again in Romans chapter 13 and verse 5. Be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, who is ultimately restricting us, but also for the sake of conscience. Why it reminds us, <coughs> excuse me, sorry gang. That's a great mug, Emmy. Thank you. Why it reminds us, our Canadian government is within its charter right to restrict our freedoms. As individuals, we cannot actively disobey civil laws like speeding, parking lot rules, etc. Now, we've touched on this a little bit already, but there's a reality that the restriction is ultimately coming from God. And I know I'm, I'm always using the driving example, and my problem is I'm self-righteous because I think I'm better than everybody else on the highway, and then I'm passive-aggressive, and I know, Pammer, I'm, there's... there's limitations and, and, and shortfalls in, in my own character in this light. However, you don't leave off one just to get, because the other isn't perfectly done. I've got to do a better job of not being so self-righteous about that and so passive aggressive at times. At the same time, there's a law that the speed limit on the 401 is 100 kilometers an hour. And Ark and I talked about this a while ago and he reminded us how we were talking about, look, the fact that someone else is sinning doesn't give us the right to sin. Because that's the argument in driving. Well, you just need to go with the flow of traffic or you're not going to be safe. You know, the Lord who told you to obey the governing authorities is the same Lord who knew you'd be driving on the 401 with 99% of the people flouting the law. Most of the Christians that I know and talk about giggle and say, yeah, I don't obey the law. Well, you don't say it though. We say, well, I, I just, I, I, I only go 10 kilometers over because the cops let you off for that. Wow. I only steal $5 of the bill from the lunch counter today because they don't notice it. Does that make any sense to us? This is not me being self-righteous now. This is, this is not my problem in this area. I'm, but I mean, I'm, I'm joining in the solution. Brothers and sisters, there's something sinfully entitled, an entitlement to sin, because other folks are doing it. Before we know it, we're starring in the emperor's new clothes. Others are doing it. Others don't have a problem with it, so why should I? Friends, there's something about understanding that where God restricts our freedoms ultimately, submission to that restriction is a submission to our king. And you see, the last point here is true. Submission is part of our sanctification. Because God's sanctifying this out of me, this I will not be ruled. Don't tell me you're not the boss of me, right? I mean, it's just so instinctive to all of us. The root of my sin is that I will do what I want. And my sanctifying, my purifying, my consecrating, my transformation into the image of Christ, part of that happens by submitting to my king. And that's what this beautiful passage again. We were in First Peter chapter 2. And I'm back up just a little bit to verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover up for evil. Wow. I want to be more like Jesus. And for the Lord's sake, I will obey the stinking laws out there. I don't know if a mask works. I think it does. 
You know what happens when you put rubbing alcohol, this, this hand sanitizer? I don't know. I don't understand how far COVID can leap from one person to another. Why is it six feet? Why can I be up on the stage with this much room and now it's okay? Why, why can I, you know what I mean? After a while, you just think, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord. And he says to listen to what the safety protocols of the governing authorities are saying. So it's part of my sanctification. Be subject to the, for the Lord's sake, for every human institution. Why it puts it this way, apply to the earthly kingdom. We must not allow the passions of our flesh to control our response, even to unjust earthly governments. That's the truth. Listen, we must submit our bodies to our governing authorities as it is right to do. And you think about those governing authorities in closing, brothers and sisters? Turn to the book of Titus, chapter 3. And look how he tells us to think about these guys. And maybe this is a good place for us to end. Because it seems like it's open season on politicians, right? It seems like it always is, right? Trump this and Biden that, Trudeau this, and you know, whoever the leaders he's against these days, I, I can't seem to keep track who's where the <laughs> where the blocks of, of voting is in the house now. But nevertheless, look. Remind them, remind the Christians to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Remind them. He doesn't say teach them. He says remind them. He says there's an expectation that they know this. They've been taught this before. To be obedient. To be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. Boy, scroll back on our social media the last year. Erase, 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 erase. Where am I speaking evil? Yeah, but he's an idiot. No, no. Evil of no one. That's not about their behavior. Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling to be gentle in this beautiful verse and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. Perfect courtesy towards all people. Lord, Bless us and help us to do that. Father, we end our evening together quickly, but we do so, dear God, asking that you would cause this truth to just ring in our ears. May we speak to our children, to our parents, to our loving mates, our wives and husbands, to our neighbors, indeed our church members, the students and coworkers, the people at the checkout, people at the gas pump, even those telemarketers that call us up. May we deal with and speak to people with perfect courtesy. For the sake of the one who has perfectly dealt with us in grace, we pray in his name. Amen. Thanks for joining us tonight, friends. See you next Wednesday night. Cheers.